that levels mountains Calms out highways through the sea I've seen his power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands to fight Sins get lying to his knees I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet That's the power of your name Just a mission makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing That's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus Thank you Lord There's a hope that calls out courage In the furnace unafraid The kind of daring expectation That every prayer I make Is on an empty grave Sing That's the power of your name Just a mission makes a way Let's give God a hand clap of praise today. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for chains to come. Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands yes. Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence, you never fail me, yeah. 
of God, can we give God a hand clap of praise to everybody? Amen. We thank Him for His faithfulness. God, thank you for all you've done for us. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your faithfulness is with us even today. The same God. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me Let's make this our prayer this morning Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now How I need you now Yes Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness I'm calling on the God of Mary Whose favor rests upon the Lord I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of Jacob Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giants Oh God, oh God Oh God, oh God, I need you now How I need you now yeah. Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness Oh God, my God, I need you 
standing on You heard your children then You hear your children now You are the same God You are the same God You answered prayers back then And you will answer now You are the same God you are the same God You were providing then You are providing now You are the same God You are the same God You moved in power then God moved in power now You are the same God You are the same God step of the way. Amen and amen. Hey, New Hope. My name's Brooke. I work with New Hope Kids. I'm so glad you're here this morning. I want to welcome you. You can go ahead and sit down for a minute. Um, whether you are watching us online or you are here with us in person, just welcome. We're so glad you're here that you're here with us today. Um, if this is your first time here at New Hope, welcome. I wanna ask you if you would, please make sure you fill out your connection card and you're gonna to wanna to take that to our guest services table outside under the gazebo after service because we have an exclusive New Hope gift for you. You don't wanna miss out on that. It's just our little way of saying thank you for being here. Um, we have so many things going on here, you guys. And really, honestly, the way that we're able to accomplish all the ministries, all the things we do here, is largely out of your support and your generosity. So we have uh, a few really simple ways that you can give. Um, first of all, the New Hope app. If you don't have it on your phone, go to the Google Store or the App Store, download New Hope Eastlake. It's a great tool. You can listen to the messages and get the message outlines and find out all the, about the events. And, and also there's a giving platform on there. So make sure you do that. Uh, you can also go to our website, newhopeeastlake.org or if you like the envelope thing, there's a black box in the lobby and you can fill out an envelope there. So that's that. Now, New Hope family, we have several things going on. Well, we have a lot of things going on, but we have a couple really fun classes coming up. First of all, Belong at New Hope. And this is gonna be on Sunday, June 5th. Now it's gonna be at 5 p.m. So it won't be right after service, it'll be 5 p.m. And whether you're new or whether you've been here a long time, this is where you wanna go if you haven't been to a Belong at New Hope class because this is where you really get to explore who, know, who New Hope is, what we're all about, 
where we're going for the future, and kind of what our mission is with everything. So make sure you check that out. Uh, dinner and childcare will be provided. Then on Sunday, June 12th at 1130 a.m., so right after service, we have New at New Hope. So guess what? If you're new, you want to go there. It's a great opportunity to meet some other New, new Hopians and uh, meet some staff, get questions answered, um, enjoy a lunch together, and your kids are welcome to come too. Um, so again, for those events or for any of the other things, make sure you check out our website, newhopeeastlake.org, and you can register for everything there. Pray with me, please. And so the Bible tells us to seek justice, to help those that are oppressed. Micah nope. 6 eight. And so we are here to remember. We're also here to celebrate because Jesus died on the cross for us. Everything's changed. How long is it going to take for us to understand how much God loves us? He doesn't just want us to have the hotel experience in humbly with your God because God has set you free and goes against what God whether or not we're helping the oppressed and standing up for those hero. remember Moses he did we're not like live humbly we're to love people Good morning. How you guys doing today? <laughs> hey, how many of you guys would consider like yourself a leader or maybe you're in a leadership position at work? Anybody? Raise your hand. I want to see the hand. Up, up. Come on. Okay. All righty. Um, how about any of you like aspiring leaders? You're like, uh, maybe not quite the leader. Maybe in my job, I'd like to be a leader or I wanna, I'm an aspiring leader. Anybody? Come on, no Baptist mode, Pentecostal mode. Hands up, come on. Yeah? Okay, so we got a few, okay? So we, we've got a lot, of, a lot of leaders. Listen, we need more leaders in ministries here. One of the main observations I made when I started here is that we have a few people, amazing, committed people that do a lot. We need more leaders. If you're a leader, if you're an aspiring leader, we need you. We have entire departments that we need leaders Four. We need leaders over all of our, uh, all of our uh, first impressions ministry. We need somebody to lead the greeters. We have like 20 to 25 people that are signed up to pray with people after service. We need somebody to lead that. We have an entire spiritual development department that we need a leader for, and we need leaders within those areas. Our missions department, local, global, we need leaders for those. We have so many areas in our kids' ministry, in our, in our teen ministry. Uh, we need leaders upon leaders upon leaders. And so I'm a big believer in collaboration. And so if you're a leader, if you want to be a leader, fill out a connection card, put on there, I want to lead something, and we will contact you and get you plugged into something. Sound good? Yikes. Sound good? Yes. There we go. Great. Hey, we're in a series right now entitled Being Great When Life Is Not. And we've been going verse by verse through 1 Peter. And what's interesting about 1 Peter is that Peter is encouraging these believers that even though Times are tough, and times are tough because they're being persecuted, 
There was a big fire in Rome and Nero blamed all the Christians. And so they had to flee because he unleashed literal hell on earth for these believers. They fled to different parts of, of Asia Minor. And Peter encourages them throughout this letter that even though times are tough, and even though you're being persecuted, if your life is reduced to only being great when life is great, then you're gonna have a hard time being great in any area of your life. We have to learn to be great even when life stinks, even when life does not go our way, even when life has not turned out the way that we thought it would be. And so Peter encourages these believers over and over and over, stay strong, keep your faith, live a godly life, be respectful of those that are in authority. And over and over and over, he encourages them to be great when life is not. I, uh, I grew up in Orange County. And the area that I grew up in, my parents grew up in that area as well. And so growing up in our neighborhood, we, we had a, I had a lot of friends and a lot of people that I found out were not my family that I thought were my family. I thought they were cousins or aunts and uncles or whatever, but they weren't. They were just like friends. And, and so we had kind of a tight-knit group, kids that I would walk to school with, kind of the same group of kids that I grew up with. And, and my parents had gone to school with a lot of their parents. And so I had a lot of friends that we hung out with and did a lot of stuff with. And so elementary school, we'd walk to school. And I had one friend in particular my mom was friends with her mom, and her name was Monique. Monique was amazing. She was the most incredible girl. She was, she was so sweet and so kind, but Monique was different. She was different than all the others. Um, Monique was what we would call today like a little person. But Monique wasn't just a little person. She was a little, little person. In those days, it was known as like she was a dwarf. So she was little. And Monique was built different. Her body was configured in such a way that she, she waddled when she walked. And sometimes she wasn't very stable. She could be knocked over pretty easily. And, and, but Monique was kind of in our friend group. And she was my friend. And, and we'd walk to school together. And I'm the oldest of my brothers. And for a good chunk of my childhood, it was just my mom and my brother and I. And so like, I'm a protector. Like I used to sleep with an alloy post under my pillow when I was young in case somebody broke in and messed with my mom or my brother, I could protect the family. And I'm, you know, first, second grade, you know? And, uh, and so Monique, I, I kind of always looked out for Monique. And of course, you know how cruel kids can be um, in elementary school, there's a group of kids that seem to always mess with Monique. They would make fun of her. They would say horrible things. And today we call it bullying. Back then we didn't really call it bullying, but that's what it was. They're just a bunch of punks and being rude to her. There, there was two kids in particular, one in particular that I had my eye on. And I can remember like laying in bed at night, just thinking about scenarios of, of, of if something were to go down, what would I do to protect Monique? And, and now have in mind that I was small. I was, I, I wasn't, I mean, like I was small and I wasn't really a fighter and I didn't get in trouble in school. And, and, um, I, you know, I was a decent student and, and so I didn't really, wasn't involved in a lot of stuff where I got sent to the principal's office or anything. So one day we're at recess and Monique was on the other side of the playground and I was hanging out with my friends on the opposite side. And I had always kind of, you know, kind of always kept my eye out for Monique. I just, I loved her. She was a great friend and I felt bad for her because of how mean people were to her. And I was getting fed up and a couple of my friends were as well. And so we're watching and I'm kind of out of the corner of my eye. I see these, this group of kids start walking toward Monique. And I uh, was keeping an eye on it and they kind of go around her and I could tell they were saying something to her and she turned around and she started to walk away like she typically would. And this one kid in particular kind of followed her and nudged her, bumped her, and of course it knocked her over. 
I was livid. I mean, I, I dropped what I was doing. I just, I snapped. I dropped what I was doing and I was just in a dead sprint. I ran across that playground as fast as I could and I tackled this guy and I just started pounding him, man. And of course, the teachers, back when teachers could actually tell you no and you'd actually get in trouble for things. You, do you guys, anybody remember getting in trouble in school? You could actually get in trouble in those days. And, and so the teachers broke it up and I get sent to the principal's office. I'm in trouble. And, and, and so, you know, the principal was, was like, Ricky, and don't, only my mom calls me Ricky, so don't call me Ricky. So that's not like you. What are you thinking? Like, what are you doing? Like, what got into you? Why, why did you do that? Like, that, that, that's not you. That's not, like, like, what are you thinking? You can't just tackle this guy and start hitting him. And, 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 and I can remember, I swear like it was yesterday, I told the principal this. I'm in, get it, I'm in fifth grade. And I said, you know, Sometimes there's a reason to fight. And I don't know what happened to me. I, I don't remember. I, maybe I had the right. I will not beat up punks at school 500 times on the chalkboard. I don't know what it was, but I, I, I didn't get suspended. I know that. And I don't even know if they called my mom, but, but it was whatever I had to endure, it was worth it to me. I didn't care. I didn't care what I had to endure because I was going to protect Monique. The title of my message today is Sometimes There's a Reason to Go. We're gonna wrap up chapter three, 1 Peter 13 through 22, so you can follow along on your app or in your Bible. Peter, throughout this letter, and last week we talked about, he's encouraged these believers to be respectful. Even when suffering injustice, they're to obey, respect the king, they're to respect the leaders of the Roman Empire. Slaves are to respect their, their, their owners. Last week we talked about where he said, do not return insult for insult. Do not, you know, repay evil with evil. And so throughout the letter, even though Peter early in his life didn't always follow that, he's mature now and he's teaching people to be mature and to do things in a respectful way. But sometimes, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, sometimes there's a time to draw the line in the sand. Sometimes there are situations or circumstances where we have to dig our heels in the ground and say enough is enough. And that's the way I felt about Monique. You can only go so far before I'm gonna do something. And so Peter in this text today talks about some things where these believers at some point, even though they're going to be respectful, even though they're going to be kind, there are some essential things, some things that they're going through that they have to dig their heels in and say, not on my watch. Enough is enough. No more. And we'll see what some of those things are. Verse 13 through 15, Peter says, now who will harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you. He says, you know what? Sometimes you suffer for not just doing wrong, but sometimes you suffer for doing right. And sometimes you have to be willing to suffer for doing the right thing. And he said, if that happens, if there is a time where you have to draw the line in the sand and you have to suffer for doing the right thing, then he says, God will reward you. He says, so don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. You see, Peter's comments in verse 13 through 14 seem to suggest that these threats are in relation to their Christianity, to their belief system, to their ability to worship God. And in the midst of these threats, Peter says, you still must worship Christ. So there's sometimes there's a reason to be courageous. Sometimes you have to be willing to go against the grain. Peter tells him sometimes there's a reason to be courageous. Sometimes there's a reason to draw the line in the sand and say enough's enough. 
you know, I'll give into this and I'll give into that and I don't mind going here. But at some point, we have to dig our heels in and say, we're going to go against the grain. We're going to go against culture. I don't care what's going on around us. At some point, we have to stand up for what we truly believe in. And Peter tells them that these threats are coming and they have come. But even if the threats come, you still must worship Christ. You see, if I'm threatened to stop practicing my faith, if I'm threatened to stop using God's word in my life, if I'm threatened to stop telling others about Jesus, if I'm threatened to stop practicing my faith, which is what was happening on a large scale in Rome, sometimes you have to draw a line in the sand and say, you can only push me so far. And Peter says, if, you, if, I, if I suffer for doing what is right, Christ will reward me. You see, as I stand up for my faith, or excuse me, as I, as, as I stand up for my beliefs, and, and there's a reason sometimes to be courageous, it's going to go oftentimes, if we're really standing up for truth in God's word, it's going to go counterculture. It's not always going to be in line with what society says or what everybody else thinks. But Peter says, when we do this, when we draw a line in the sand, but we do it in the right way, it opens a door for us to tell people about the hope that we have in Jesus. Because think about this. If we just give in to everything and we let the world squeeze us into its own mold and we just become and think and believe and act like everybody else, then what do we have to communicate to people? Like what, what, what truth do we have to tell them about? What do we have to say to people? And so he says, you'll have an opportunity to speak of what? Your doctrine? No, but you have an opportunity to speak about the hope that you have. What hope? The hope in this life and the hope beyond this life. There's a situation that Peter encountered just like this in Acts chapter 5, and we can see what him and the apostles did. In Acts chapter 5, you know, the Holy Spirit had come. And the church was spreading like crazy. People were being saved. Thousands of people were being saved. And Peter and the apostles are preaching. And, and we see in chapter 5 that people were following them. Crowds were coming from everywhere. They were healing people. Miracles were happening. The gospel was being spread. It, it's incredible the things that were happening. And of course, as which was custom to those days, the religious leaders didn't like it. We talked a little bit about that on Easter in my message called Bad Religion. You had these group of religious leaders that did not like it. And so they tell Peter and the apostles to stop teaching about Jesus. And Peter like didn't even listen. They just kept doing it. So they arrested him. They arrested Peter and they arrested the apostles. They put him in jail. And then God did an amazing thing because Peter... And the apostles were released from jail. So the religious leaders go to, to check on them, and the gates are still locked, the locks are still locked, the guards are still in place, but Peter and the apostles are gone. And somebody said, hey, I saw them in the temple preaching Jesus. We're like, how did that happen? And so they're preaching Jesus, and so they go and they arrest him again. And they bring him before the high council, they bring him before the leaders, and they tell them, we're not going to tell you again. Stop preaching about Jesus. You're, 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 you're causing an uproar. Stop. So when is there a time to draw a line in the sand? When is there a time to be courageous? Peter and the apostles said, right now's the time. So these religious leaders, they flogged them, which wasn't just a hand slap. It was a whip that had chunks of bone and glass and thorns and, and so they beat them heavily. And we know this, that when they told Peter and the apostles to stop preaching about Jesus, Peter said in verse 29, it's in your notes, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human authority. But didn't Peter tell us in 1 Peter that we're to respect authority, that we're to listen to the king, that we're to obey, that we're to be respectful, that we're not to repay evil for evil, we're not to, 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 to cast insults? Yes, he did. 
But there's also some things that are worth standing for. There's essentials and there's non-essentials. And Peter's saying, these essentials, like preaching Jesus, we're not gonna stop. As a matter of fact, when they sent them away and they told them, we're warning you again, do not preach Jesus. Look, look, look at the verse says. This is great. Verse 41, it says this. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer for his name. Isn't that amazing? They didn't have this woe me attitude or okay, we get, we get it. I mean, that hurt really bad we're done. We're going to stop. You win. It's over. The next verse says that that very day that they continued every single day in the temple preaching Jesus. Peter and the apostles said, you know what? We're going to be courageous. Sometimes there's a reason to be courageous. We're going to draw a line in the sand and you can do whatever you want. You can arrest us, you can flog us, and we know eventually they'd be martyred for their faith. We're going to preach Jesus no matter what. So when is it okay to push back to take a stand? When I'm asked to sin, when I'm asked to renounce my faith, when I'm asked to violate God's word, and you say, well, that's not going to... It's already happening. It's already happening. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, is there ever a reason for us to be courageous? Are we willing to go counterculture, not in a rude, judgmental way, but in a way where we say, you know what, sometimes there are some things that are that important to me where I'm gonna draw the line, because sometimes there's a reason to be courageous. Sometimes, number two, there's a reason to stand up for our faith. Verse 16 says, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. He says, keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good if this is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Peter makes an interesting point in this verse that, that we can actually stand up for our faith which we might be standing up for the right thing, but we do it in the wrong way. Thus, it discounts the very thing that we're standing up for. Does that make sense? Peter says that when we're standing up for our faith and when we're telling people about the hope that we have, we need to do this in a gentle and respectful way. You see, there, there are some times we get certain things that we're passionate about Sometimes they're biblical, sometimes they're not biblical. Sometimes it's more personal preference or conviction. And we think that it's our job to put people in their place. We think that it's our job to set people right. And we do this in a very mean, a very judgmental, a very rude way. And in essence, what we do is we discount the very thing that we're trying to communicate. And you see, Peter says, when standing up for your faith... When telling people about Jesus, this should be done in a gentle and in a loving way so that when people talk, and they will, they don't have any way to accuse you of being a jerk <laughs> or for being rude or for being arrogant or for being a horrible human being. We do this in a loving and a kind way. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians Paul tells us that if I can speak with all the languages of the earth and, and, and languages of angels, but I don't love people, I'm like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He says, if I prophesy, if I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all of God's secret plans and possess all kinds of knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could actually move mountains, but I don't do this in a loving way and I don't have love for people, then, Peter, or then Paul says it's pointless. He says, if I gave everything to the poor and I even sacrificed my body, in other words, even if I'm martyred for my faith, I can be martyred for my faith and it mean nothing. I mean, that, if you're gonna give up your life, you, it needs to accomplish something, doesn't it? But he's saying that I can do all of these things even to the point, and he's making a point, that, that, that I can be martyred for my faith, but if my attitude is wrong, if I have hate and anger and judgment and resentment towards people, I haven't really accomplished anything at all. Matter of fact, he says that. Paul says that at the end of verse 3, I would have gained nothing. Peter tells them sometimes there's a reason to draw the line. However, in doing that, we need to remember to do that out of love. 
In the Old Testament, there are two shining examples of this. One is Joseph and the other is Daniel. Daniel was told, you have to worship Nebuchadnezzar and you have to stop praying. If you don't, we're gonna kill you. And Daniel said, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> I'm not abandoning my God and I'm not gonna stop communicating with my God. Do whatever you wanna do. And so we know they threw him in the lion's den. And God did this incredible thing. Joseph was accused and thrown in the prison for something that he didn't do. And in the midst, Joseph was not only a model citizen, he told people about, about the Lord while he was in, in prison. And when there came a time when Pharaoh was having these dreams, Joseph had such a good reputation among the prisoners and everybody else that they needed somebody to help Pharaoh interpret these dreams. And guess who they called on? Joseph. And he ends up running the entire stinking country and delivering his people. And God ended up using Daniel in incredible ways as well to do something similar. And they both became leaders. They didn't become bitter. They didn't become angry. They weren't mean to other people because they'd suffered injustice. They had personal beliefs. There's a line that they wouldn't cross, but they did it with integrity and with respect and with kindness. And as a result, God used them in even greater ways than they could have ever been used before they went through what they went through. Does that make sense? Sometimes there's a reason to be courageous. And sometimes there's a reason to stand up for our faith. Verse 18, Peter says, Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Peter says, sometimes there's also a reason to sacrifice. Sometimes there's a reason to sacrifice. I love what Peter does throughout this letter. It's really interesting. Peter raises the bar for these believers and he sets the standard and he's being empathetic and sympathetic for what they're going through because they're going through a lot, but he still encourages them to be great even when life is not great. And I love what Peter does while he's raising the bar, while he's raising the standard, while he's encouraging to him to do all of these things. He always mentions throughout this letter and he does it again here. He reminds them that Jesus did the very same thing that he's asking them to do over and over. He says, Jesus is our standard. Peter says, I'm not asking you to do anything that not only that I have not done and am not willing to do, but I'm not asking you to do anything that Jesus hasn't already done for you. So Peter is asking them if they need to sacrifice, whatever they need to sacrifice. And they had already sacrificed a lot. And Peter uses the example of Jesus. He said, he died for our sins, but he said, he never sinned. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't deserve it, but he took on our sins. And why did he do that? so that he could bring us home safely to God. Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself so that we could be brought home safely to God. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to sacrifice for your faith if need be? Are you willing to sacrifice financially? Are you willing to sacrifice personally? How many of you have ever heard of a guy named Polycarp? It's a really coolest name ever. Anybody ever heard of Polycarp? Yeah, there's only a few people that have ever heard of Polycarp, and it's sad. We're going to throw a little church history in this morning. Polycarp was the leader of one of the seven churches, of one of the churches of Asia Minor. Remember at the beginning of 1 Peter, because of the persecution, these believers fled to the different parts of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. And of course, with these believers come the gospel, hopefully, right? And of course, these churches sprung up. Polycarp ends up becoming one of the leaders. And what's interesting about Polycarp is that when he died in about 164 AD, he's about 89 years old, the writing of this letter, the things we're talking about are about mid mid-80s, mid 60, Peter, or excuse me, Polycarp was probably one of the last men to have actually walked with the apostles, actually known the apostles. 
And so Polycarp is leading this church at Smyrna. And even a hundred years later from what we're reading here, there is still persecution. The Romans and the Roman Empire hated Christians because they refused. They drew a line in the sand. They refused to worship and to sacrifice to the Roman false gods. They refused. They completely refused. And so it just brought about more persecution. And even in the face of persecution, they, they're going to stand up for their faith. They're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to do whatever they needed to do to stand up for their faith. Polycarp had been warned over and over and over. Now, he had such respect among the Roman people, among the church, among the leaders. People loved Polycarp. They respected him. He's such an amazing man that they gave him opportunity after opportunity to renounce his faith, and he refused. So at the old age of about 86 years old, they set out to arrest Polycarp to make an example of this Christian leader. And they're hoping, of course, that it will cause other people to stop living for Christ because of the consequences. Polycarp is quoted as saying when they came to arrest him, they gave him one more chance to renounce his faith. And this is what he said, because there are, this is documented. 86 years, it's not in the Bible, but it's, it's documented after such, or a, after that. 86 years, he says, I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Polycarp at the ripe old age of 86 said, I'm going to draw a line in the sand. You can do whatever you want to me. I'm not going to stop preaching Jesus. There, there's do whatever you want. There's no way that I'm going to stop preaching about God. There's just no way. And he wouldn't stop. They arrested him and they brought him before a big group of people and they were going to burn him at the stake. And Polycarp's like, no need to put me on the stake. I'll stand right here and joyfully be burned for my God. And so they burn Polycarp. And according to the reports, Polycarp, the, the, the flames that were surrounding him became kind of like a cell where he was kind of like in this bubble of the flames and his body was not actually being burned. But the Bible, or not the Bible, but people have said that he was kind of like glowing. Like when you put gold or silver in fire, he was glowing. And so much so that he was burning and burning that he wasn't dying. One of the guards was instructed to actually pierce him, to stab him with a sword and according to reports, his body bled so much that it extinguished the flames around him. And he didn't die of being burned. He died from the wound of the sword. And reports were that from that point forward, Polycarp had such a great reputation and he was willing to sacrifice for his people, for his faith, that Christianity began to spread even more and more and more and more. And even some of the leaders of Rome ended up being converted because of Polycarp's example. Sometimes there's a reason to sacrifice. Lastly, and then we're finished, verse 19 through 22, sometimes there's a reason to celebrate victory. Now this section of scripture, it almost seems misplaced. You're like, what does this have to do with what Peter is talking about? He throws in some very confusing things. Now, we don't have time to dissect. I literally could do a series just on these verses at the end of this chapter. If you're a Bible nerd and you like to dig deep and get into it, man, look into this. It's an interesting section of scripture. But we're not gonna let all these details distract us from the main point because Peter is trying to make a point. And he uses some confusing verses, some confusing wording that we'll get into a little bit, but we'll dissect at a later time. Speaking of Jesus, he said when he, so he went and he preached. So after Jesus died, he went and he preached to spirits in prison. Well, who are these spirits and where is this prison? We'll talk about it in a minute. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. What? <laughs> what does this have to do with Noah? Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water, 
speaking, the water of the flood is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body. So Peter's not saying baptism like saves us. He's saying it doesn't remove that sin. It doesn't remove that stain, that dirt from us, but it's a symbol of the, what the waters did for Noah and the ark. And it's also a symbol of the life, burial, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So he said, but a response to God from a clean conscience, it is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now Christ has gone to heaven and is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers except his authority. Now this section can be really confusing and oftentimes the more you talk about it and the more you dig into this, the more questions you have. And again, we don't have time to go through it, but there, there is apparently, we know this through the scriptures, that there is a spirit world around us. We even read a little bit earlier in this text that Peter said that Jesus died physically, but was raised in spirit. And according to the scriptures, the Bible talks about there are, there's an entire, there's a parallel universe all around us. There's a spirit world that we cannot see. Matter of fact, John in the book of Revelation counts them into the millions upon millions that are just surrounding the throne of God. And so we know that according to, to the Bible, matter of fact, 34 out of the 66 books of the Bible talk about angels. 103 times in the Old Testament, 165 in the New Testament. That there are angels, but not only are there angels like we think of good angels, but there are also bad angels. When Satan was cast out of heaven, when Lucifer was cast out, the Bible tells us that he took a third with him. And apparently out of this third there is a group of them that's related to what happened during the time of the flood in Genesis 6. You can read all about it, and I'm not going to get into it because it's confusing. But apparently, there's a group of these fallen angels that were responsible for how bad things were in the time of Noah. Matter of fact, we know that Noah preached for 120 years and not one person repented. 120 years, you'd think one person, not one person. The Bible says that during those times, evil was on their mind continually. So Noah preached and preached and nobody repented. There was this bad generation, something happened. And these angels, these evil angels were cast into this, what's known as like an abyss or a bottomless pit. It's not hell. It's a different place. Apparently, there's, an, uh, there's a different area where the worst of the worst are held. When I lived in Arizona, I did prison ministry for several years. And, and even then, in the prisons, you have medium security, you have you, you know, maximum security, and then you have areas where the worst of the worst are held. And apparently, there's something like that that God has made for the worst of the worst. Matter of fact, we know that in the book of Revelation that at the very end, Satan and his demons are gonna be cast into this abyss, this bottomless pit forever. So apparently there's a group of them that are being held, which means God is more powerful because they're being held against their will. They're there. Matter of fact, we see in reference in the New Testament where Jesus was casting out demons and these demons said, Are, have you come to judge us before our time? Do not throw us into the abyss. Have you come to judge us before our time? So there's this separate area, this worst of the worst place where they are being held. Peter referenced, or it's referenced in Acts chapter two. The Apostles' Creed even references it. But let's not lose sight of what Peter's trying to get across because what apparently happened, what most scholars feel, is that when Jesus died, he descended. Descended where? He descended to these spirits. What spirits? These, this group of fallen angels that are the worst of the worst. Now, you would think that because the Messiah was crucified, that Satan thought he had won. And this is another study. <laughs> we'll not get into this. But throughout the history of the world, Satan has tried to keep the Messiah from coming into this world. 
That's why the Hebrew boys are being murdered and this and that. It's over and over and over. The Jews have always been a target of extinction, always to stop the Messiah from coming. And so you would imagine that when Jesus died, physical death, Satan is thinking, it's over. We won. It's done. We accomplished what needed to be accomplished. And these, this group that are being held in this abyss are probably celebrating. And then somebody shows up. Peekaboo. You see, he's not preaching to the lost. He's here, the Bible says, Peter says, to make a proclamation. Well, what's that proclamation? And what's the whole point of everything Peter's talking about when it comes to the ark, when it comes to baptism, when it comes to verse 22, Jesus sitting at the right hand of God? What's the point of this dissension, this abyss, this bottomless pit? It's to proclaim one thing, victory. You see, sometimes... There's a reason to celebrate victory. And Jesus did what he did to let him know that game over. <laughs> what God wanted to accomplish has been accomplished. You did not win. And how is this important to these believers? It's important because of this. Peter's saying, I know you're suffering. I know you're in pain. I know you think that Nero and the Roman Empire are winning. I know you think that they have won, but they have not won. You need to understand that you're on the winning team. You've already won. Jesus has already accomplished your, vic your victory. The game is over. Game, set, match, done and done. It is over. You are victorious no matter what happens to you in this life, no matter what happens to your body, no matter how much you have to stand up for him, no matter how much you have to suffer, you've already won. And so Peter is encouraging. Somebody wants to celebrate. So Peter's encouraging them. He's saying, you know what? Just like the ark where God saved the eight, and just like what baptism represents, that our old life is gone and our new life has come, we have victory. And just as Jesus in verse 22 is seated at the right hand, which is the place of authority, the place of victory, you have victory too. Even if you don't feel like it, you have victory. Maybe some of you here today and you feel defeated in your faith. Maybe you feel like, you know what? I don't feel like I'm winning. Well, I would almost guarantee that you're not going through what these believers are going through. That doesn't discount what you're going through, but you need to know that if you've given your life to Christ, you're on the winning team. And maybe you're at a point in your life where you have a decision to make. And that decision might be, is this real to me? Like this faith, this belief in God, is this real to me? Does it mean something to me? And maybe for some of you, it's maybe a hobby. Maybe it's just you go to church because you've always gone to church, but outside of here, it doesn't really make a difference in your life. We have generations and generations of people like Peter, like Polycarp, that sacrificed everything so that we could have what we have today. And that is our faith, our belief. Have you ever come to a point where you said, you know what? I'm done compromising. Enough's enough. I've got to stand up for something. I mean, my faith's got to be something to me. If you haven't, I want to encourage you. Because you're going to win in the end regardless. Because Jesus has already won. Father, thank you so much for your blessings, for your word. God, I pray that you just empower each person here today. And if there are people that are struggling with their faith, if there are people that are struggling with their beliefs, God, I pray that you not only give them assurance, but you give them courage. 
and power and the ability to stand strong even in the midst of opposition. Father, we have that empowerment, not through our own strength, but through your Holy Spirit. And so God, I pray that you empower each person here today. And if somebody asks us the hope that we have, that we're able to explain that in a gentle and kind way. Father, empower us today. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.
you so much today. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in to New Hope this week. You know, the church doesn't stop when the video does. And make sure that you share this with a friend. You can even support what we're doing via the Give button here on the left. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single Sunday. And we cannot wait to see you this week, either in person or online. Have a great day.